pray. <clears throat> Jesus, um, that is our prayer. We've just sung it. Would you awaken us? Holy Spirit, as we read the scriptures, would you uh, reintroduce us to your word, King Jesus? Only you can do that. And so we ask, Lord, that this would go beyond just um, reading a book, but that this would be meeting with a person. Jesus Christ, the slain, risen lamb. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I had two um, experiences in college that I had no clue God was going to um, use, and, and I don't know if you've been there, but uh, going walking through something that you fight tooth and nail and then looking back on it and going, God, you were in that the whole time, um, and thank you for being stronger than me. One of them was uh, I had, for my major in college, I had to do a practicum. Now, this practicum, I was convinced, had nothing to do with my career path. I was the kind of guy that um, I didn't take um, no for an answer all that easily. Anyone? So I set up, I asked first uh, if I could do something else for my practicum because, like I said, I was convinced that this would have no bearing on my future whatsoever. I set up a meeting with my department chair, and she said no. And I said, that's just strike one. I got three to play with here. Um, And so I came back with some more evidence as to why this role would have nothing ever to do with anything that I ever planned on doing with my life. And once again, she said, no. Um, I set up another meeting. No, again, um, there was a theme that she she was like, Ryan, you are going to do this. This is part of your practicum. This is part of your education. You're going to work in our early learning center. And I looked at her, and I'll remember this conversation. I said, I'll do it, but I guarantee you it's never going to, I'm never going to use this information in my life, right? Um, So the other um, experience was uh, I worked at Starbucks, and I thought that I was just slinging lattes and learning how to serve coffee, and um, I had no clue when I was in college that I would ever work at a church that owned an early learning center and a coffee shop. So if you think God doesn't have a sovereign divine sense of humor, think again. I mean, I'm fighting both of these things, and God's just up there going, oh, Paulson, come on. You're going to be glad I'm stronger than you someday. And um, praise the Lord, I'm glad he is. But all that means is that I drank enough coffee in college to kill a small horse. Okay, that's what it, that's what it means. When you're in college and you work at Starbucks, it means you have an IV in your arm. Um, and it's great for some things, and it's um, terrible for others. But I um, went through college and and my young adult life wondering why anybody would ever drink decaf coffee. I would get somebody a decaf latte at at 7 a.m. and think, brother, you're crazy, okay? You're crazy. Now, as I've gotten a little bit older, I had an experience a few years ago where um, I was lying in bed at 3 in the morning looking at the ceiling reconsidering whether or not I should drink decaf after noon. Anybody with me? (laughs) Right, right. So you've been there. You've been there. Um, And here's the thing about um, decaf coffee uh, and regular coffee. If you were to sit down across uh, uh, me from the table and I gave you a cup of coffee, you'd have no clue whether it was decaf or regular. Um, Not at least until a few minutes or however fast your system moves, hours after where you were either bouncing off the ceiling or sedated, right? still. You'd have no clue. It tastes the same, looks the same, is brewed the same, and and everything is pretty similar about it. Um, The thing with caffeinated coffee is it has, um, some would argue, a wonderful effect on you, um, depending on how early it is and how much sleep you've gotten. Decaf, no effect. None. Just tastes good. That's it. Some effect, no effect. I think the Christian life is pretty similar. There's some in here who have had a, have a relationship with God that changes everything. Where you would go, it has an effect on me. There's a, there's a presence on my life. There's a power on my life. Um, Jesus isn't just somebody I read about in a book that's a few thousand years old, but he's a person I know and I 
walk with. And then for others, it's more like, well, yeah, we do this whole church thing. We, we get together on a Sunday morning and we sing songs and the band's great and it's fun and it's good, but, but very little about our life is actually influenced or impacted or changed. And so here's the, here, here's the difference. Some of us are, are drinking decaf and some of us are drinking caffeinated. And here's the way the scriptures are going to unpack that. Um, some of us have a relationship with spirit. The Spirit's alive in us, and so it's not just we read about Jesus in a book. We know Jesus, and we walk with Jesus. And for others of us, well, we just know about him in a book, and our faith really isn't in him, and so very little about our life actually changes. I ran across this anonymous quote this week that says this, Christians who neglect the Holy Spirit are like a lamp that's not plugged in. They have all the shape, they have all the form, they have all the, hey, all the potential. They just don't have the power. They don't have the light. Um, Charles Spurgeon, and if you've read any Spurgeon, this isn't going to surprise you, says it a little bit stronger, okay? Um, Not everybody's favorite preacher, but here's what he says. A church in the land without the Spirit is rather a curse than a blessing, so, so he's going to go, hey, if, if the Spirit isn't on us, if we gather and we talk a lot about Jesus, but we don't know Jesus, and the Spirit doesn't live in us and live inside of us and stir us with affection for Jesus, then we are worse off, our community's worse off because of our presence here. He goes on to say, a church in the land without the Spirit is rather a curse and a blessing if you have not the Spirit of God, Christian worker. Remember that you stand in somebody else's way. You're a fruitless tree standing where a fruitful tree might grow. Wow. Charles. Have a cup of coffee. (laughs) Settle down, right? Settle down. Decaf, bro. No. He's right. He's 100% right. If we're just playing church, friend, will you look up at me for just a second? If we're just playing church, can I assure you we can find a better thing to do on our Sunday morning? If this is all just singing about and not knowing in the guts of our body that Jesus is king, that his spirit resides in us and that we walk with him, if this is about anything other than that, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. So you you don't have to be a genius to figure out, based on our song selection and intro, that what we're talking about this morning is the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer. We're going to look at one of the most debated passages of Scripture. People have used it as a springboard to build some pretty crazy theologies. Um, And what I want to do is I want to reel it back in this morning, ground us in the text, and ask the question, Jesus, what do you want us to do with what we read in Acts chapter 19? And I'm well aware that any time I teach on the Holy Spirit, I can draw a line down the center of the room. One half is going to think I didn't go far enough. The other half is going to think I went too far. So my goal is to be an equal opportunity offender this morning. Okay? (laughs) This is, in a sense, a troubling passage, but I think it has beauty, it has answers, and it has an invitation for us in it. Acts chapter 1, or 19, (laughs) Acts chapter 1, we were there 31 messages ago. Acts chapter 19. Starting in verse 1, Dr. Luke records for us, this is Paul's missionary journey number 3, and he starts like this in chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, Just a quick time out, we'll circle back to this. Why in the world would he ask that question? Because his assumption is their answer would be yes. Right, okay, smart crew. And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? You can imagine he's sort of scratching his head a little bit and going, "Um, listen, this whole thing that I've been preaching around the globe has gone off the tracks here in Ephesus. What's the deal? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, 
John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who would come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Oh, interesting passage, yes? Here's uh, where I want to start. I want to start where Paul starts, and, and here's where he starts. He goes to Ephesus, a town he'd been in before and comes back to, observes people who are carrying the name of Jesus, and starts to ask questions. Here's what he does. He validates by his questions. He validates their faith journey up to the point where he meets them and sees them. And he validates their humanity by saying, I'm not just coming in an overhanded didactic fashion, but what I want to do is, is let's talk. Let's talk. So there's three questions that are either explicitly stated in this passage or implicitly implied. They are in your outline. Do you know... Have you received, and will you enter? They're questions that Paul asks the disciples, quote-unquote, at Ephesus, and they're questions I'd love for us to wrestle with this morning as well. He shows up on the scene, his first question validating their faith journey and their humanity is, do you know? Do you know about Jesus? Do you know about the Spirit? Do you know about what it means to be baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Why does he ask, do you know? Here, here's the deal. Because what you know, understand, and believe dictates the road that you walk. What you know, what you understand, and what you believe dictates the road that you walk. Um, belief drives behavior. Information dictates involvement. And, and here's what we see, I think, in this passage pretty strong is that education directly leads us to experience or encounter. Why does he ask, do you know about Jesus? Do you know about the baptism of Jesus? Because if they don't know about the slain, risen lamb, they will never embrace the fullness of what God has designed them for. They're, they're going to be drinking decaf coffee. It's going to have the shape. It's going to have the form. It's going to have all the flavor and taste, but it will have zero effect on their life. My guess is that's what Paul observes Hey, you guys talk a lot about Jesus, but it doesn't really seem like you know him. Your, your orthodoxy, the, the, the right belief about God hasn't led to a right living. Do you know your, your education always dictates your encounter? It dictates what you know about God. What you know about God leads directly to how you live with God. If you don't know that the Holy Spirit resides in you, then you will never step out on faith believing that he does. So this is huge. This is absolutely huge, friends. We could go back through, um, the, the, through back, back through the history books and we could find people that lived this out in a secular environment time and time again. Wilbur and Orville Wright, other than having epic names, played a pretty significant part in history. In 1903, they created the first plane that could actually um, not, not, not take off. That wasn't the first time that somebody had done that. But Orville and Wilbur created the first plane you could actually steer, which I don't know if you've been on a plane lately, but how many people are grateful for their invention, right? <laughs> this is big. How'd they do it? They didn't do it because they had the most money. There was actually somebody else who was, long story, but competing to be the first. You don't know his name because he didn't succeed. But what they did was they created a wind tunnel in their house where they took data measurements. And they decided and they found out and they thought, hey, if we, if we create it like this, then the plane's not only going to be able to get up, but it's going to be able to sustain its flight. And the pilot, wow, will be able to steer Praise be to God. Right? Well, their education directly leads to our experience. What they knew and what they found out allowed them to fly. Last time you were on a plane, you probably didn't look out the window and go, Orville and Wilbur, thank you. 
See, here's the deal, though. Our education, our information always leads us to our encounter. So what we believe about God, friend, we look up at me for just a second. What we believe about God directly influences, creates a path that we walk. And that path is either with him, side by side, intimate, personal presence, or, 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 it's talking about him rather than with him. So Paul shows up on the scene and he's like, hey, um, one, do you have the spirit? But, but two, have you heard of this guy named Jesus? And they say yes, but then they were baptized into John. So let me sort of unpack this for us a little bit. Um, here's the difference. Baptism into John. Uh, he even says it here. John baptized with a baptism of repentance. Okay? So time out. Here's what John's baptism is. John's baptism, baptism is turning from sin. Turning from sin to receive forgiveness from sin even. But it's incomplete. See, the gospel is not turn from your sin. That's not the gospel. The gospel is turn from your sin and run to Jesus. You need both halves of that in order to have the gospel. The good news isn't repent. The good news is repent and believe in and on the Lord Jesus. So, so here's the deal. I meet so many followers of Jesus and they wouldn't say I was baptized into John. That wouldn't be their, um, their verbiage they'd use, but I can assure you they're baptized into John. Here, here's what I mean by that. They are believers in Jesus who live under guilt, who live under shame, who live under the lie that, well, God would want nothing of me or with me because of my past. These are people who are baptized under John. So they feel really bad about their sin, but they haven't felt the embrace of the Father. Can I just tell you, that's not Christianity. The Holy Spirit never creates refugees. Okay, so refugees are those who leave their home or are beaten out of their home and go to no man's land. This is not the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit in the life of the believer is, yes, conviction, not condemnation, but conviction about sin. We'll get to that in a second. Repentance, so a changing of mind and heart, and not running to no man's land, but running to the loving embrace of a father who's already running towards us. So this is, Paul goes, do you, do you, do you know? That's, that's absolutely huge. You may have left the system of the world. You repented, but did you, have you, friend, have you run to Jesus? That's the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit, in the Scriptures at least, is never about the Spirit. The Spirit is this great mirror. And you go, anytime you want to give the Spirit glory, he's going, oh no, not about me. It's about him. It's about Jesus. He is the slain, risen lamb. It's about him. So it pains me to use a positive illustration about this person, but I will. Tom Brady. <laughs> got MVP of the Super Bowl. And he was given a truck. Because that's what he needs, another vehicle. <laughs> um, and, and he goes, hey, listen, like, I didn't, this shouldn't go to me. This should go to Butler, who made the interception on the one, yard, one and a half yard, half yard line. This, is, this should be his truck. This is, this is actually about him, and he just deflects glory. This is the way the Spirit works, pointing people to Jesus. The Spirit is never about the Spirit. He's always about the Son. So he lifts high the Son, points to the Son. And so here, here's what we would say is that the object of our faith, friends, so this is the educational piece of what Paul wants to unpack. The object of our faith determines the fruit of our faith. What's the problem with the quote-unquote disciples in Ephesus? They haven't met Jesus. That's the problem. His question implies, did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Implication, 
You should have. You didn't? Not pray this prayer to receive the Spirit. That's not what he does. Go back and read it. What he does is, let me unpack for you the fact that you got stuck in a halfway house rather than going all the way to the arms of the Father. You left sin, but you didn't know the embrace that's found only in Jesus. So what he meets is people who know a lot about God but don't know him. That's what he meets. People who can talk the talk. But when it comes to actually walking and living it out, They're drinking decaf because they haven't met Jesus. The spirit doesn't reside in them. I love the way that uh, Frederick Dale Bruner puts it. He says this, the work of the Holy Spirit, oh, this is awesome, is to thrill us with Christ. That's, what's the work of the spirit? How do you know if you've been in a place where the spirit resides? Jesus is beautiful. You love Jesus. He's magnificent. Your affections are stirred for him. You see him seated, the slain risen lamb seated on the throne. And you go, you're worthy of my life. You're worthy of my honor. You're worthy of my praise. You are Lord. That's the work of the Spirit. That's the work of the Spirit. To make him beautiful in the hearts and lives of those who believe. The Holy Spirit, it's great, is shy about everything except Christ. But about Christ, the Spirit is downright bullish. That's awesome. That's great. It's downright bullish. So, so the first question Paul asks, do you know? Do you know? And it leads into his second question. Here's his second question. Verse 2, he said to them, did you receive? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard of the Spirit. And he said, well, then what were we baptized into? And they said, into John's baptism. Here's what his question implies. When you believe, you most definitely receive. This is the natural outflow of belief in the Son. The Father loves that, sent his Spirit to dwell in those who, and to help them see the beauty of Jesus, that he might stir in them affection for the risen Lamb. Here's what we would say. Faith in Jesus leads to the presence and power of the Spirit. Look up at me for a second. In the life of every believer. This isn't varsity Christianity. This isn't, all right, we've got to play on JV for a while, and then we'll have a, a worship service where we lay hands on you or we do something. This isn't in addition to the Christian life where you get there someday. This is the normative Christian life. Faith in Jesus, receiving the Spirit. Now, um, we got to put on our theology hat for a moment because as you read through the scriptures, there's going to be um, some times like this where it looks like, it looks like on the surface, I, I think if you get under it, it doesn't look like that, but it looks like um, the Spirit comes after belief. There's, a, there's really three passages of scripture in the book of Acts that would, um, I don't think they suggest that's normative, but that would be sort of the storyline. Two di difference I want to point out for you. One, the indwelling of the Spirit. That's what we're talking about when we say faith in Jesus leads to the presence of the Spirit in the life of the believer. The indwelling of the Spirit. Peter, at his um, great sermon at Pentecost, says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many? However many who repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus, however many people who put their faith in Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit. Paul's going to affirm the same thing to the church at Galatia. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, he asks this rhetorical question. Let me ask you only this. I'll turn it on you, Seth. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit? I'm quoting... Time out quick. Assuming they did. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or hearing by hearing and faith? 
It's a rhetorical question. They go, well, come on, Paul. We received the Spirit when we believed. And he goes, ah, exactly. So keep living that way. So keep living that way. This is the indwelling of the Spirit. Will you look up at me for a moment? If you are a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of the living God dwells in you. In you. I, I, was, um, I got here early this morning and was just praying through this space. And I got this just picture in my head as I was uh, walking through praying of, um, I think it was probably a tulip that's in the ground right now. And in the next few weeks, we're going to see it just start to blossom, right? Because the environment around it's going to change and it's going to come back to life. Uh, my, my prayer, and, and I'm just praying into this even now, is that for some of you, I think the Spirit is, is, is in you for sure because you're a follower of Jesus, but it's dormant. It's dormant. And I'm praying for an awakening in us where we start to not, not only know and believe, but walk in the reality of what we have already received. See, because there's a difference in the scriptures between the indwelling of the Spirit, you have it if you're a follower of Jesus, and the empowering or filling of the Spirit. These are two different things in the scriptures. So Paul will say to the church at Ephesus, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, as if to say there are followers of Jesus who are filled and those of followers of Jesus who aren't filled. As if to say, you play a part. So here's the way I always like to say it. The empowering of the Spirit is not about, hear me on this, is not about how much of the Spirit you have. The empowering of the Spirit is about how much of you the Spirit has. Okay, I'll say it again. The empowering of the Spirit is not about how much of the Spirit you have. Look around. All of us have the same amount of the Spirit if we're followers of Jesus. The empowering, the walking in, the presence of, that's thick on some people, is about how much of them the Spirit has. How much of their lives they're saying, I'm yielded to you, I'm listening, Father, I'm willing to walk with you, Spirit. You have my life, I'm bowed at your throne. I submit, I surrender, use me for your name and for your glory. And he goes, done! It's the people who say, no, I'm going to hold on to my agenda, and I'm going to hold on to guilt, shame, slavery, instead of walking into love and sonship. Those are the people who live under, not under the empowerment of the Spirit. It's people that say, God, I'll receive and believe and walk in what you say is true. So how much of you does the Spirit have? Because you have all of the Spirit. And I know that you're out there thinking, come on. No, I don't. The only problem with that line of thinking is scripture. You do. Will you live in it? Will you embrace it? Will you follow? Man, I'm praying the Lord would awaken some things in us and his people. Well, well, the question becomes, what is the work of the Spirit? What is the role of the Spirit? What's the relationship of the Spirit? If Paul goes, hey, it looks like you um, are on decaf coffee when you've been designed to be drinking the good stuff, what is he observing? What's he not seeing in the Ephesian quote-unquote disciples? John's disciples, but disciples in the scriptures nonetheless. What are they missing, and what do followers of Jesus have? What I'm flying through is um, a mapped area of everywhere. There's an ecstatic outbreak of the Spirit speaking in tongues, prophecy. And what I wanted to say in this, but didn't because I didn't have time, actually I'm saying it now, um, <laughs> is what you see in Acts chapter 19 is not normative. It's Acts chapter 1 verse 8 being spread from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is what we see is because, one, God wants to show Paul, I'm at work in this place, and two, God wants to show the Ephesian church, he has apostolic authority, listen to his message, and take his message to the ends of the earth. So you see what we see in Acts chapter 19 because of it. What's the work of the Spirit? One, 
to give us the life we were designed for by the creator of all life. In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus says, my words are spirit, and the spirit is life. The role of the spirit is to awaken us to the goodness of God, to remind us and point us back to why we were created, to know the love and overflow of the Father. That's the work of the spirit. Second thing, to invite us into and to make real the relationship that you and I have with God. The Spirit makes this a reality. This isn't a game that we play. In fact, Paul will write to Timothy and say, have nothing to do, have nothing to do with a form of godliness that denies its power. This isn't a game we play. This is a person we walk with. Here's how he says it in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. This is how the Apostle John says it. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us. How do we know that? Well, because he's given us his spirit. In John chapter 14, John's going to write, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. This word helper um, actually could also be translated comforter, counselor. The work of the Spirit is not only to make alive and to bring into relationship, but to be a comfort for the people of God. How many know that comfort intimately? Yeah. It's one of the beautiful parts of being a follower of Jesus. He speaks to you in the peaks and the valleys of life. I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm in you. I'm good. I'm not leaving. It's the work of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit. He reminds us or brings to mind the words of Jesus, John chapter 14, verse 26 says. He's the great reminder. You ever, you ever been in a situation where all of a sudden a Bible verse just flies out of you? Maybe you're sharing your faith with somebody. You're going through a difficult season at home on the job front, and, and, and the Lord just brings to mind a passage of Scripture. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit loves to remind us of the words that Jesus has said. I will say, side note, he can't remind you of what's not there. Okay? This is why it's important to hide God's word in our heart, not just have it accessible on our iPhone. Is there a difference? Is there different? Having God's word in your pocket and in your heart are two very different things. He reminds us of the word of God. Um, John chapter 16. Listen to this. This is wonderful. And when he, the spirit, comes... And, and the Spirit is always personified. It's never it. But when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This is the role of the Spirit. Now remember, we said that the Spirit never leads us to become refugees. And, and a lot of followers of Jesus, they'll go, yeah, He convicts people of sin. He does, but He also convicts people of righteousness. That's what the passage just said. The work of the Spirit is, oh yeah, absolutely you have failed, but I can assure you Calvary has covered that. Jesus is good. His blood is sufficient. His grace is enough. Run to him. Don't get stuck in between. Don't become a a spiritual refugee, but but I'm going to convict you of the righteousness that is yours. Look up at me for a moment. Conviction is different than condemnation. Conviction is different than condemnation. Now, the problem is it feels the same. It feels the same at first. Oh man, I really screwed up. Oh man, I can't believe I did that again. Oh man, whatever your thing is, fill in the blank, it feels the same. Condemnation leads you out into the wilderness for you to replay that tape over and over and over in your mind. Conviction leads you to the throne where Jesus says, I've paid it all. I've paid it all. Now, the work of the Spirit in the life of the believer is to convict, not to condemn, to convict and lead us to Jesus who has already, past tense, purchased our righteousness. Can I assure you, if whatever you hear in your head or your heart leads you anywhere else except to the throne of God, it's not the voice of Jesus. And it's not the Spirit at work. Um, I'm already going too long. He can, uh, the Spirit lives inside of us to guide us. The Spirit lives inside of us 
to make alive and to make real the love of the Father. Um, In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says that the Spirit lives inside of us and he makes real, he makes alive the love of God. What if that was our litmus test? Do I know the Spirit? Well, does the love of God burst inside of me? God, you're amazing. God, you're good. God, you're gracious. I can't believe how good you are. And lastly, but certainly not least, the Spirit produces in the believer the fruit of the Spirit. It's called fruit because he does it. He does it. It's his work in you as you stay in step with him. Here's a beautiful thing. Every single follower of Jesus has the Spirit question is, does the Spirit have us? Will we surrender? Will we bow? Will we follow? Well, the passage ends, and we'll land the plane here. It says, and he, Paul, entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So here's what just happened. Paul connects trust or faith in Jesus with receiving the Spirit. So do you know, have you received, and will you enter? As if to say that those who trust in Jesus and receive the Spirit are led to the closet door of Narnia where God opens it for us and says, will you come and play? Will you be part of what I'm doing? Will you be part of my kingdom? Will you be part of the renewal and restoration of all things? Will you be part of my redemption and restoration of my beautiful creation that I love? Not a coincidence that a receiving of the Spirit directly precedes a walking into and living in the kingdom. See, the presence of the Spirit always opens up to the believer the reality of the kingdom. The reality of the kingdom where people are healed, where demons are cast out, and where, come back next week because we're going to camp out here, where revival starts to take place. Revival starts to happen, but what happens first? Believers encounter the one true living God, the slain, risen lamb, Jesus Christ, give their lives to him, receive the spirit, and then start to walk with him. That's what precedes it. A lot of us want revival, but I don't know if we want surrender but I don't know if we want to surrender first. And that's what precedes this revival that we see in the book of Ephesus. Wow. Well, there we go. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Here, I really do, can I, can I just, let's pause here and, and we are landing the plane. But I will say, there's an enemy of your soul that wants to distract you from either believing or hearing the message that God puts his spirit inside of you. Loves you, died for you, paid for you, purchased you. It's done. You know what the problem is for most believers? Their head and their heart. We don't know, therefore, we don't walk in. And I think there's a number of followers of Jesus. We we simply don't believe that when we trust Jesus, we receive the Spirit, and then we're invited to enter his kingdom and to partner with him in his beautiful renewal of all things. See, that when the people of God walk into their Christ purchased destiny and walk by the Spirit. Listen to me. Cities are changed, people are freed, and his kingdom comes. And I pray that more and more, friends, we would be the type of church, we'd be the type of believers where we walk in that. We know it, we receive it, and we enter. I pray that you will. I pray that I will more and more. Let's pray. Jesus, 
we don't want to have a form of godliness and, and deny its power. We don't want to play church. So spirit stir in us, awaken in us, like we've already prayed. Lord, I, I just pray into that picture I have in my mind uh, for some who are in this room right now, Lord, and they're followers of you, but their faith has grown stale. The spirit in them, your spirit in them has grown dormant. Lord, I pray that this morning there would be a repentance, that there would be a receiving of forgiveness. And Father, that we wouldn't just be left as spiritual refugees, but that you would lead us all the way home. Right, if that's you, we just raise your hand. You feel like I'm here, but the Spirit's just dormant in me. I believe, but God, yeah, hands all over them. Yeah. Jesus, for my friends here, with their hand raised, I pray that you would stir something in them that only you can stir. Holy Spirit, would you move? Would you change? Would you break up the hard soil around our heart? And remind us of the love of the Father. Remind us of the reality of the spirit within us. Lord, help us repent, help us believe, help us surrender, and once again, be filled with your gracious, glorious spirit. May it point to Jesus, may it lift him high, may it glorify him, may it make him beautiful in our eyes. It's in your name that we pray, amen.